Hey, what's going on everybody? Modern Vintage Collector here, back with another episode of Behind the Photo, where we take a look at uh, some of baseball's most iconic photos and the kind of the history and the backstory about them. Uh, in the last episode, we looked at the circa 1910 photograph of Honus Wagner moments before he assaulted the photographer for committing the crime of stealing his bat's hitting power by taking a photo of him. If you missed it, go check it out. It's just a short, funny video about a baseball player and his superstitions. Uh, in this episode, we take a look at the photo right above it, which is arguably the, the most iconic baseball photograph. Uh, the image captures a 23-year-old Ty Cobb doing what Ty Cobb did best, tearing up the base paths and anything that got in his way, which in this instance was uh, New York Highlanders third baseman, um, Jimmy Austin. Now this image is my personal favorite. I didn't realize it was iconic as it is, um, but across the spectrum, um, this is one of the most highly praised baseball photographs and some just run-of-the-mill photography groups. Highly, highly, highly thought of. Um, but I actually found a colorized version of this and I, I just can't imagine the time and effort it takes to sit there and color the individual parts of the slides. That More power to them. I wouldn't ever want to do it, but it's pretty amazing what they can do. Uh, nonetheless, this photo was taken in 1910, just like the Wagner. And it was taken by sporting news photographer Charles Conlon. What I like most about this picture is it really captures the intensity of Cobb. I mean, even if it, you can only see a profile picture of his face, I mean, you can just feel the intensity. And I just, I would never, ever, ever want to be on the receiving end of Ty Cobb, that's for damn sure. But when you think about photographs being iconic uh, normally there's some sort of historical significance to it take for instance the 1988 world series uh, kurt gibson with the two bad knees hits that walk-off home run and a photograph of him coming around third with his fists in the air i mean photographs like that that take you back to a time and place um, and you can you know feel the moment to me that's what generally makes a photograph iconic. What's interesting about this one is it doesn't have any of those attributes. As a matter of fact, I don't think this game could get any more insignificant than it was. It was just a mid-July game, Detroit versus uh, the New York Islanders. That's it. No more, no less. Outside of this photograph, it was probably the only significant thing about it. I'm sure if you dug in the newspapers, you could probably find an article or something if you tried hard enough. But for all intent and purposes, this, this was just a, 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 another day on the ball field. But the first element about this photo is the fact that it was an action photo in an era where there really were no action photos. You take into account the technology of the day, a photographer really had to be in the right place at the right time to get something like that. And that's why most photography that you see from this era is, you know, you got Stan Musial standing there with a bat, or you got uh, Jimmy Fox, Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig just standing there. Um, and his Wagner just sitting over his bat. You might get some of those goofy, obviously staged for the camera action shots, the ones that look really awkward. But for true action shots, they were just, they just seldom ever happen. You know, the photographers didn't have the option of, you know, the cameras that take 6,000 frames a second. And, you know, you can go back to your computer and flip through and be like, oh, this millisecond looks better than this millisecond, so I'm gonna use this one. And now you have this magnificent photograph. And it was really one shot, one kill. So you really only had one shot and opportunity to get the, the best photo that you could. So they had to be very selective, and when you have to be selective, you're gonna miss a lot of opportunities. Second, the fact that this photo was taken completely on accident, and according to Conlon in an interview with the Sporting News in 1937, he didn't even know that he'd shot it. Conlon was friends with, with Austin, and so he was standing off the third baseline just chatting it up, and uh, it was one out, Cobb was on second, and Austin had moved up to defend against the bunt. 
Well, as soon as the pitcher's arm went back, Cop took off for, for third. And the crowd saw what was going on, so they got all excited. It confused Austin. So he awkwardly stepped back and was met by a cloud of smoke containing Ty Cobb and ended up getting pulled over in the process. So Colin was so caught up in the moment, making sure his friend was all right, he didn't know if he'd snapped the photo or not. So, you know, he played it safe and switched out his cartridge and put in a new one. And, you know, spent the rest of the day kicking himself in the butt for, you know, that missed opportunity of that great photo he could have had. He's quoted as saying, no, oh, now there's a great picture and you missed it. Thinking of, you know, the photo that could have been. But he went ahead and went home, developed his plates, and to his amazement, this developed one of the most iconic photographs in baseball history. But you can see that the original photo is much larger than the cropped version that we normally see. But to me, you know, I, I honestly, I like this one better because it takes all the action and puts it in the middle of the frame. But the original photo, you know, is almost a testament to the fact that it was so incidental because, you know, Colin was a revered photographer. He knew how to shoot, so he wouldn't have had all the action over here and then had this big field of nothing over here. So, you know, that fact right there is just a testament to how incidental this was. And, you know, the, the, the chance that he just caught the action on the left side of the, the left side of the lens. The fact that this photo defied all of these odds is nothing short of amazing. Had he been, you know, two inches more to the right, it would have cut half of the people off. So, you know, so I mean, that's really what makes this photo iconic. And naturally, you know, once this photo was released, God went under scrutiny again. And he was already dubbed the dirtiest player in baseball by Connie Mack following the Frank Baker spiking incident in 1909. You know, so for people to see him taken out of Austin, you know, was just further solidified people's preconceived notion that he was a, a dirty baseball player. And then he also had the infamous uh, Paul Kitchell at the plate um, where he was jumping and trying to kick him in the, in the privates. But that's going to be the topic of my next video, the Cobb Critchell collision at the plate. Um, and along with that, we're also going to talk about Cobb's sliding style, see what other players had to say about his, his base running, and uh, also look at why Cobb always went in spikes first. Um, there's actually a reason for that. Uh, there's a book called My 20 Years in Baseball, which is a composition of articles that he had written for a newspaper um, after his playing days had ended. Uh, if you haven't read it, it's, it's a really fantastic read. It's all about Cobb and his thoughts on life and baseball and how the two related. Good read. Real short, but a good read. But in my, uh, just a side note, in my research for this episode, I, was, I ended up looking at Cobb's stats from 1910. And they're really, they're nothing short of amazing, especially in the dead ball era. And while it's hard to really compare nowadays and back then, I mean, the game has changed so much and now you have science involved and batters are facing more pitchers uh, per game than they used to. I mean, it's seldom that you see somebody pitch an entire game, you know. So when you factor all that in, it's really hard to compare. Uh, but you can't ignore his stats all around. But I mean, in 1910, he batted 382 with a 455 on base percentage, 549 slugging average, and a 1.004 on base plus slugging. And he only had 46 strikeouts and 597 plate appearances. Now, when you look at his home run column, it looks a little sparse, but what you have to understand about Cobb is he wasn't a power hitter. It's not to say that he didn't have power, that just wasn't the game that he played. And honestly, power hitting really didn't become a thing until Ruth came on the scene, which is really the um, the focal point of the, the, the feud between those two. Cobb thought that, uh, you know, a home run baseball just kind of undercut the game. It, he thought it made it one dimensional. But, you know, a funny story is that um, the reporters were giving Cobb a lot of crap because, you know, you had Cobb on the scene, or I mean Ruth on the scene, hitting all these home runs. And they're like, well, why don't you hit home runs like Ruth? And uh, so then he went out that day, he hit two home runs, went back, told the reporters, see, I can do it. And then he went back to playing Cobb style of baseball. So he simply did it just to prove a point. But I guess that's about all I have for tonight, as always. 
Thanks for watching, and we'll catch up with you next time when we talk about the Cobb-Kitchell collision at the plate.